to the first episode of the second season of Next Quest Podcast. I am your host, Noah S. Garcia, Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor, and today I welcome to the show Dana Sayre, Registered Drama Therapist, who will be discussing their area of experience and specialty, drama therapy. Welcome to the show, Dana. Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me. Happy to be here. So question list, um, what are your credentials and experience? Yeah, so uh, I'm a registered drama therapist, which is a master's level credential and it requires education in drama therapy, specific theories and techniques as well as psychology. So like human growth and development, abnormal psychology, theories of counseling. Uh, And then it also requires theater Um, theatrical experience, um, internship hours, and uh, professional hours. Cool. Um, How many programs are there for that? I would imagine there's not many. No. uh, Now now I'm going to feel like I'm not sure. It's it's either five or six um, in the U.S. and Canada are accredited programs currently. Um, but they also, I did alternative training. Uh, so my master's degree is in performance studies, um, which is a related uh, discipline. It's an interdisciplinary humanities degree, um, basically. Um, and so, uh, you know, basically people can either, like I already had my master's degree um, before discovering drama therapy, which is not uncommon. Uh, but people can also co-currently, so say someone wanted to get their master's in counseling or, or even, you know, a master's in directing, they could also be doing an alternative training contract at the same time. Um, and then you just bring in your, your previous education and experiences uh, and see where you need to fill in the gaps, um, if that makes sense, to meet the same requirements as if uh, you went through an accredited program. So just to be clear, you are not a licensed counselor or therapist. Correct. Yeah, drama therapy uh, is its own profession. Okay. What is the difference between a registered drama therapist and, say, a licensed professional counselor or other licensed mental health providers? Yeah, so I think because drama therapy, um, which is one of the creative arts therapies, is very interdisciplinary. There are some drama therapists, certainly, who are licensed counselors or marriage and family therapists or social workers, but there are also people working in special education, um, the prison system, people who are just working for nonprofits or a variety of community organizations. So uh, really much more diverse applications, I guess I would say. Yeah, for sure. Okay. For what modality is drama therapy generally used? 
Yeah, um, I think you're, you're speaking to like individual versus group. Yeah. And I think uh, drama therapy, I, I feel is most successful as group therapy um, because it's coming out of a lot of um, dramatic and theatrical processes. So like, of course, you know, the creation of a play is a group process, but also when drama therapy was coalescing as a field in the 1960s and 70s, you know, we're also seeing a lot of uh, solo autobiographical performance, kind of like one woman show. I also see stand up comedy kind of as a form of like therapeutic totally. yeah. theater. So there are certainly individual applications. And I think because sort of our Western idea of therapy is, is more often individual therapy, um, I think a lot of drama therapists kind of do work one on one as well. Cool. Um, so do you have a sliding scale? Yes. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm definitely, um, especially, you know, wanting to work with uh, marginalized communities and, and even in my own lived experience of, you know, not being able to afford therapy at various times in my life. I think it's, it's important to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and just to, to note, uh, Dana is joining my practice. Uh, they're going to be offering some personal enrichment groups. Uh, we're going to have a trans and non-binary uh, teen D&D group, a trans and non-binary adult D&D group, a teen exploration of gender group, and a, a general LGBTQIA plus group. Um, and that information can be found on my website, which is www.nextquestcounseling.com. All right, Dana, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, what about evening and weekend appointments? Yes, uh, I'm definitely willing to be flexible. Um, I do have some, some personal commitments as well as the groups that Noah just outlined. So I would just say contact me um, and, and we can work that out on a, a case-by-case basis, but I'm definitely open to it. Is being a drama therapist your first career? If not, what was? I guess it depends what you mean by uh, career. So I uh, went straight from undergrad into my graduate program. And then I worked in call centers uh, for a couple of years because I sort of found this gap where you could get a job pretty easily with a bachelor's and no experience, but if you have a master's degree, they want you to have three to five years of experience. And I felt like, where am I supposed to get that experience? And so I, I sort of struggled a bit. And then I worked uh, for Book Woman for a couple of years and I was doing some freelance writing and I, and I was sort of trying to figure out like, okay, like what am I gonna do and how can I use um, you know, my passions and my skills uh, in some way that's, you know, not only useful, but also, you know, allows me to live. And so that's when I kind of circled back uh, and discovered drama therapy and started my training. So I guess cool. like, yes and no. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I, uh, before I got licensed, I was an optician for a short period of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the, the random things we do, right? Right. Um, so what drew you to pursuing drama therapy? Part of it was just trying to figure out how to have a career, um, you know, as someone who's passionate about theater and drama, and then also just reflecting on my own experiences, um, you know, in undergrad and graduate school with performance and acting and how therapeutic it was for me and just really being curious about how to harness that healing potential uh, intentionally. And when I went to my first uh, national drama therapy conference, they always do a pre-conference principles of drama therapy workshop. And I remember one of the facilitator, facilitators saying that, you know, sort of everyone that comes to drama therapy kind of invents it. <laughs> you know, for ourselves, and then is either very excited or disappointed to discover that we haven't invented it. And so I think, you know, the fact that over and over again, we all independently kind of come to the same conclusions about the healing power of drama, you know, speaks to um, 
the efficacy of our profession in its own way. Cool. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself, hobbies, interests, TV shows you're watching, music. Yeah. Um, so hobbies and interests, uh, I definitely find cooking and baking. Um, it's a big hobby of mine. I you play around with sourdough. I have a kombucha scoby. Uh, it grows exponentially. So if anyone <laughs> is wow. listening to this and wants to uh, brew kombucha, I'm here. <laughs> I can give you this <laughs> Um Gardening, uh, to whatever extent I can do it right now, I'm I'm in an apartment. Um, like sci-fi fantasy stuff. So obviously I, I play D&D personally, which is what um, made me interested in like, running groups. Um yeah, and I think just, uh, I don't know, I, I watch Netflix a lot. Um, I, I was uh, binge watching Parks and Recreation uh, before NBC decided to make their own <laughs> streaming service. So I've had to and start branching out, <laughs> find some new shows. I hate when stuff like that happens. Um, so what does it mean to say drama therapy is embodied? Yeah. So for me, that goes back to like Rene Descartes and the mind body split in philosophy where, um, you know, some people sort of decided that the mind and like all of our cognitive and like logical properties were somehow separate from the body and, and kind of applying these like baser instincts to the body, um, which I think now, you know, even neuroscience is really proving how false um, that is, you know, looking at the vagus nerve um, and all of those sorts of things. And so I think psychotherapy is sort of just now recently coming around to like paying attention to like somatic sensations and things like that more. Um, But I feel that drama therapy you know, has really been doing that all the time and exploring like how can movement um, and gesture and affect um, really be uh, healing. So I know you kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, the foundations. What are some of the theoretical foundations and approaches that drama therapists commonly use? Sure, there are some major um, foundational theories, one of which is uh, Jacob L. Moreno created psychodrama and sociodrama, uh, and that's kind of one thread that, that currently um, informs drama therapy. And then there's also um, the five-phase model of drama therapy, which explores what drama therapists call aesthetic distance, which is sort of like how close or far away I am um, from whatever role. So, you know, whether you want to do like fictional characters and improvisation versus, um, you know, exploring role plays based on my life. Um, Then there's also just role theory in general, which um, in part pulls from things like Jungian archetypes, but also like if you look at sociology and like social roles or identity politics and just kind of saying that Um, We all have these variety of roles that that we've either chosen um, or which have sort of been imposed on us by society. And a healthy person has a a wide range of roles um, that they can embody or enact and and flexibility to move between them. But then for some people, you know, whether it's a trauma history or something else kind of gets stuck in a role and, and, or maybe feel trapped or or sort of don't know what to do with it. And and drama therapy can really help um, someone try to gain more of that flexibility. Um, And then drama therapy can also pull from things like theater of the oppressed um, and the work of Augusta Bilal to really look at dynamics of power and privilege and how those can play out um, in interpersonal uh, relationships as well. Very cool. Um, can you give examples of each of the five phases? Sure, yeah. So the five phase uh, model of drama therapy starts with dramatic play, um, which could be, you know, a variety of theater games or, or, or sort of the warm ups uh, actors might use uh, to start off of a rehearsal. And then you can also play improv games 
um, and things of that nature. And then you would move that into more extended scene work, but still operating from these fictionalized characters or roles um, that are being created. And then out of that scene work, mm -hmm. more often uh, themes are emerging that are relevant to the group. Uh, and that can lead people to then start to want to explore and role play scenarios that might be happening in their own lives um, and, and sort of cre maybe creating characters that are kind of closer and closer to what my lived experience is, which is the third phase. The fourth phase is um, a, a deeper sort of culminating enactment. And I think that's where you can draw in psychodrama and really maybe exploring some of those uh, childhood experiences or just a deeper exploration of current issues. And then there's also a dramatic ritual. Um, and I think, you know, all of these phases can be present um, in a single session, but also if, if someone were creating an arc, say of, you know, eight weeks or 12 weeks, um, you could think about how to move between phases, but, but the ritual aspect is both to help build the container, but also processing, especially towards the end of a group, closure, how are we making meaning out of all that's happened in the group, perhaps creating a transitional object um, to take with you things of that nature. How long do groups usually run for? Uh, I think it, I'm sure it varies a lot. Um, as far as a single session, um, certainly there are people that do full day uh, workshops. I find for myself that two to three hours is kind of the minimum to do anything um, of substance. And then um, certainly you could have just ongoing um, open or closed groups or, um, you know, set up. Here's an eight week, 12 week, you know, 16 week series. It just, it kind of depends on the situation. Okay, cool. Um, what is an example of a drama therapy technique or activity that you use? Yeah, um, one of the techniques that I found most helpful is um, what drama therapists call projective objects. So I think a lot of people uh, might struggle with embodiment or sort of, you know, have anxiety around it. Um, and so being able to choose an object and then um, play with the object through like movement or, you know, saying lines, um, almost kind of like puppetry in a way, um, I think that can be a way to gain um, some distance and some comfort with role play um, if, if actually embodying the role physically it feels too much um, for that person. And then I think also uh, storytelling um, and how, you know, people could perhaps create monologues or, or write poems um, or things of that nature is also interesting um, to me as well. And then especially during COVID and like the constraints of, you know, virtual therapy, I think drawing more on like art um, and drawings. And so I think one of the things I really value about drama therapy is being able to use metaphor. And so if um, an individual has used some expressive or metaphorical language to describe an experience, like what would it mean to like draw that out, you know, um, and really explore that further. Cool. Love it. Um, what are some common misconceptions about drama therapy? Yeah, I think, oh, because, um, so for just for example, um, my registration number is 765, <laughs> so there just aren't uh, super many of us. And so I think a lot of people haven't heard of drama therapy and don't sort of realize um, how deeply rooted it is in artistry, um, you know, first and foremost. And so even on the NADTA website, you know, they talk about drama therapy having roots not only in psychology, but anthropology. And so I think also my interdisciplinary background in performance studies, you know, I found that really being able to pull from, um, you know, anthropology and sociology and philosophy, you know, just as much as psychology 
to understand the human experience can be really um, beneficial. And so um, really looking at drama therapy as an integrative um, and interdisciplinary approach. What populations would benefit from drama therapy? I want to say any and all. Um, I think, interestingly, um, most often I find that drama therapists kind of get assigned the like quote unquote problem patients that like no one else knows what to do with or, you know, kind of everything in the book has been thrown at them and nothing has worked, um, you know, especially for drama therapists that are working in like inpatient settings. So I find that really drama therapy is well suited to exploring like comorbid issues or just really like complex um, trauma. And I think also because um, we can use, you know, drawing or vocalizations or gesture and movement, drama therapy can also work really well with like people who maybe um, are nonverbal or have limited um, verbal capacity um, for processing. And so I think often drama therapists end up working in, you know, again, special education, the prison system, um, you know, with refugees, the homeless, kind of all of these like stigmatized and marginalized groups. Okay. And what about, you kind of touched on this briefly, but uh, what sorts of issues can drama therapy help with? Yeah. Um, for myself, I found that it's really works well um, exploring issues of identity and then I think especially marginalized identities and like internalized oppression and being able to unpack like what are the narratives you know or scripts that I've picked up um, from society versus you know what I want to keep or not. Um, you know, inner critic work, inner child work um, can all really effectively um, be done through role play. So those are some of the things um, that I've done. Okay. What kind of experience do you have working with particularly vulnerable clients, such as those who are transgender, undocumented, or BIPOC, to name a few examples? Yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, queer and non-binary, and that's certainly one of the reasons that I decided to go in this direction was just struggling myself to find providers who were competent to deal um, with those identities in therapy. So I have a lot of experience, you know, not only in my own lived experience, um, but doing workshops in the community there. Um, I've worked uh, with domestic violence, uh, homelessness. And then I uh, worked on the, um, with mood disorders um, in patients, like depression, suicidality, things of that nature. Okay. How are your group sessions structured, if any? Mm -hmm. So generally there's um, the warm up, and then, you know, which could be either, you know, a game or, or some kind of structured check-in, just like how do we get a sense of sort of like where everyone's, you know, heads at today. Um, and then whatever uh, activities um, or interventions are planned for the day. And then some kind of closing ritual is kind of the, the most loose structure. Um, and for myself, I'll usually plan something out, but then I think just also being tapped into that spontaneity of being willing to, you know, throw the plan um, out the window as well and kind of go with the flow. Got it. What could a new client expect from their first group session with you? Yeah, so the first session is really um, going to be building the connections within the group <clears throat> or what Moreno would call sociometry. So um, really just learning more about what everyone is bringing with them, kind of their hopes uh, and desires for the group, um, just general uh, demographic questions to sort of start to figure out this process of, you know, what do we have in common? Um, are there common themes and issues, you know, that might emerge that are going to guide our work together as we move forward? 
how would you say your clients would describe or experience you? Uh, <laughs> I'm not always great at questions like this, so I guess I'll speak to how I hope that they do experience me. Um, I definitely, you know, resonate with person-centered psychotherapy and really wanting to provide that unconditional positive regard um, and that safe space where people feel free um, to, you know, express um, and be in touch with themselves, you know, without sort of feeling like they have to hold something back. And I, and I would hope that, you know, we could also, I think, you know, one of the things I appreciate about drama therapy is it can be playful. So I also hope that they would experience me um, that some of that playful, you know, humorous energy um, as well. Cool. I can, I can imagine that you would be playful. I can, I can picture that in my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you willing to laugh or cry with your clients? Absolutely. Uh, I think it can be so powerful. And, and I, I found, you know, um, just in my own history, you know, one of the most therapeutic sessions I ever had, you know, was where the therapist was really expressing empathy with me. And so I think, um, just like mirroring um, can be an important aspect um, of drama therapy too. And so I see it as role modeling in a way, like the more I can bring my authentic self and my range of human experience, the more it gives other people permission to do the same. I can see that. How do you define holding space for someone? Um, I see it as being fully present uh, without judgment and um, really just leaving room for, you know, whatever uh, needs to emerge in the moment. What is the best advice you've ever received from a supervisor? Yeah, I think one of the things that, you know, was most helpful to me, I think there, there can be this sense, um, you know, especially as a client that you, you sort of learn to identify, you know, these are what my issues are, and like, I can recognize them and name them. And I, I think at a certain point, you know, when someone's had a decent amount of therapy, there can be this frustration or like, how is the same thing coming up again? Um, but, you know, I remember one of my trainers saying that like healing is a spiral or it's sort of like an onion where it's like we're just peeling off a new layer every time. And so I think um, really being able to normalize that process that like this doesn't mean that you are broken and it also doesn't mean that like none of the healing that you've done before counted. It's just, you know, here we are kind of peeling back another layer. Cool. I like that one. What have you personally learned about yourself and or the world through drama therapy? Um, <laughs> I think so much. One of the things that I really value about drama therapy is that because it is embodied and experiential, um, sort of the only way to learn drama therapy is to do it. And I mean, certainly, you know, students of counseling are encouraged to be in their own therapy process, but um, I think just being able to know what that lived experience of these techniques feels like uh, in my body, I think has been a really rewarding part of that experience. And um, I really think that the drama therapy can help build like so much um, self-confidence by being able to like practice um, different ways of like being in the world. Um, and then also it's really helped, I think, deepen my work with social justice just to see how all of these, you know, interpersonal social dynamics, um, you know, can also be playing out in our lives. And so kind of that like the personal is political 
Um, and the way that especially group therapy and drama therapy can kind of bridge this gap between like my um, individual issues and like a broader social context, I think has been really beneficial. Can you give us just kind of a rundown of your social justice work? Oh gosh. <laughs> Well, um, for one, I'm uh, currently a member of the Cultural Humility, Equity, and Diversity Committee of the Drama Therapy Association. Uh, and during my time in Austin, I've worked for a variety of social justice nonprofits, um, as well as partnering um, with just different organizations uh, throughout Austin to host workshops. Like I've, I've worked with uh, Monkey Wrench Books, and, um, you know, just different organizations like that. And I was a teaching artist with Creative Action for a while. And right now uh, I'm partnering with uh, Chronically Queer Austin uh, and Embrace Austin, which is like a new organization that's just starting to kind of bring together a lot of these LGBT organizations. So um, I think it's just kind of been, um, you know, all throughout uh, my time in Austin. Cool. What do you do to take care of yourself? Yeah, I think I've been so much more in tune with my self-care, I guess, through necessity during the pandemic. And, you know, I live alone uh, in my apartment. And so I think sometimes, you know, self-care is just kind of curling up on the couch and watching Netflix or uh, I have a cat. <laughs> so I think that's been, you know, an important um, aspect of, I guess, some sort of, if not necessarily interpersonal, <laughs> um, but connection, but like inner species um, connection, uh, going on walks. Um, and again, like cooking, I, I guess I, I know some people find it a chore, but I think, um, you know, being able to be intentional about, you know, making like nutritious food that I enjoy, I think has always felt like a form um, of self-care to me and just like, how am I literally feeding my body? Awesome. How would you define happiness? <sighs> um, I think happiness is, it's like a lightness, I guess, um, just as far as like sensations or it's, it's sort of like, um, like a vibration in my cells, I guess, where it just feels like they're all whispering. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. That makes me think of like, I don't know, little cells with like little eyes and like jumping around. I don't know. Yes, exactly. that's 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 what came and to my if head. If we were in a drama therapy session, we could then all be the cells jumping around, you know, <laughs> each person, and like, what is that? I love it. I want to do it. <laughs> um, what is the most embarrassing moment you have had as a drama therapist? This one's hard for me. I, I guess I don't get embarrassed easily. <laughs> That's good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard for me to think of anything offhand. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure <laughs> how to answer that one. Are you in therapy or have you ever been in therapy yourself? Yes, uh, yes and yes. <laughs> I've, cool. I've been in therapy um, yeah, off and on for, for a long time. And I think it's important to, as a therapist, to like stay tapped into that um, and just continue to be, you know, doing our own work. Is there anything else that you would, that you think would be good for a potential client or other therapist to know about you or drama therapy? Yeah. Um, and I guess I'll speak to, to myself and, you know, my approach to drama therapy, but I, you know, I will just say, um, I think because, you know, everyone's kind of coming from their own unique trajectory, you know, each, each drama therapist, perhaps more so than, than even psychotherapists kind of has our own 
unique brand, you know, and I think that's one of the things that drama therapy as a field is working through, like, how can we, you know, or is it, do we even want to sort of, um, you know, create more structure around that? Because I do think that creativity and spontaneity is very beneficial. But I will just say for myself, I'm very collaborative. Um, and I, I see, you know, this as like we're co-creating, you know, whatever space is being made together. So, you know, if there's ever anything, you know, that I would suggest or that we're trying that like, you don't like or, or you know, you don't want to do, that's fine. And also just within the drama therapy paradigm, the role of witness, um, we hold sacred. So, you know, even if you're in a group and there's some activity happening and you don't want to participate, you know, being able to honor that in yourself and, you know, because we have these mirror neurons in our brain and that's why, you know, if you yawn, I yawn, if you laugh, I laugh, you can gain as much from watching, right? And I mean, if we think about plays too, right? Like you go see a play, the audience benefits as much as the actors. So I think that can help people reduce their own anxiety around like, I don't know what drama therapy is. I'm not an actor. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that I also feel, I mean, certainly, you know, drama therapy can and does very well, it, you know, explore a lot of these like traumatic um, experiences or like helping people make meaning, you know, out of like suffering or oppression. But I think we kind of have this idea in our culture that like, therapy is, you know, me going and like sitting in a room and like telling someone, you know, the worst things I've ever experienced. And maybe I don't want to do that. But I also see room, um, just for example, I did a workshop um, with some colleagues at the most recent conference on queer drama therapy. And at the end, we explored like queer joy, you know, because as much as there can be trauma and pain, you know, and stigma associated with queerness, there's also pleasure and joy. And so I think so many drama therapy techniques evolved out of watching the ways that children play. And so, you know, drama therapy can be playful, it can be fun, it can be a way to be silly um, and laugh together. And I, I feel that that can be just as healing, you know, as, as any of the other things that we might do as well. Right. So drama therapy is not psychotherapy. Correct. <laughs> yeah. I, I love all the, the terms you've been throwing out there. It's, it's very cool to listen to. Um, did you act mm -hmm. previously? I could totally yeah. see that. So my OG career goal <laughs> was to be an actor. Um, but I applied for MFA acting programs and I didn't get in. And then I tried again and then I did get into some, but I, not ones I was super interested in. Um, and then also had just kind of broadened my horizons because I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. Um, and then I got accepted to the performance studies program and then um, an MFA dramaturgy program at NYU. But Texas A&M would pay for everything. So it's I felt difference. like, well, I'll go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm really, sure. I'm really glad I did. I think also one of the things that really, I guess, formulated my drama therapy consciousness, when I was in undergrad, um, we did a few devised uh, plays, which is where the, rather than starting with a script, right, the, the actors come together um, with a theme or an idea of what you want to accomplish and then you, you know, create and sort of write everything together. And so um, I grew up in West Virginia. And so there, during, when I was in college, there was a mine disaster, um, you know, in the state and my professor wanted to do something around it, but it felt like, well, we really can't, you know, it's probably too much, you know, to try to go into this but there was uh, a mine disaster that had happened in the 1970s, like not too far um, from where I went to college. And so we ended up like through oral histories and like newspaper articles and things like that, um, really creating a play about that. And so, I mean, I feel like that's really like, that's a drama therapy type of project, even though we didn't name it that. 
Um, and so I think really that's kind of, that's the stuff I'm interested in as well. Um, it's like, how do, how could we use theater and drama to like tell our stories and like the stories of our communities um, and our history? And like, it, it doesn't always have to be Shakespeare or like some old yeah. time white guy, you know? So am I, am I hearing you correct in that what you were saying is that um, you kind of piece it together as you go type mm-hmm. of thing? Okay. Yeah. That, so that really, you, you, you can use like um, so tableau um, is sort of when you kind of it's like everyone sort of you know you make a a sculpture so it's like okay uh, family like what does that look like you know and you get like five or six people up and it's like okay we're gonna like just move our bodies you know what does family mean to me and try to make a picture so you can kind of create tableaus about things. And like I said, we were sort of pulling from like oral histories and like newspaper articles to sort of figure out like what is the chain of events and then how could we move that into like scenes, you know? So it's like, we want the scene um, where, you know, people are, you know, find out that like the mine has collapsed or Um, you know, people really referenced like the press coming in, you know, so we're going to have the scene where like the press are interviewing people. And so you can kind of, in that case, you can pull quotes directly, or you can sort of create composite characters. Um, And then, you know, we invited, and I think this is true of like a lot of processes like this um, that happen, you know, we invited like people from the community and like, you know, the living relatives of like, who had experienced this in their families to come watch the show. And then they gave us feedback and they were like, these are the things you got right, you know, and these are the things that you didn't get right, you know? And then we, we could then like change, you know? And so we ended up doing the production twice because like we kind of pulled all of this stuff together and made a play and then they could give us feedback and say, this stuff was great, but you kind of got this part wrong, you know, and we could adjust. And so, Um, You know, also my performance studies research was like critical ethnography, which is when you're like doing participant observation within like a community that exists now, you know, rather than historical. And again, you know, part of that process is like getting feedback and saying like, this is how I understand it. You know, did I get that right? And so I think um, also, you know, a lot of drama therapists will create a play, um, you know, and perform that for the community. And I think, again, especially for these, for people who have stigmatized and marginalized identities, you know, whether that's refugees, whether that's the homeless, whether that's disabled people or queer people, you know, really being able to say, like, this is my experience, this is my story, And to, you know, have that sense of agency of like, I'm controlling this narrative, you know, instead of the normative culture, you know, telling me who I am. And like, I think that can, you know, be really healing for the whole community to experience Mm -hmm. that. And so I feel like those are the kinds of things where I feel like drama therapy has such huge potential. And I remember, you know, I went to a conference and one of the workshop leaders was saying, you know, (laughs) just because you're a drama therapist doesn't mean you can't still be a director, you know, or a playwright. It Mm -hmm. just kind of means like you have these extra tools to hold space because I think so often, you know, and I've experienced this myself, like as an actor, you know, stuff can come up, right. It's like, Mm -hmm. even when I'm enacting a role, it can touch something in my personal life. And so it's like, as a drama therapist, I just have tools to like, hold that too, instead of saying like, well, that's not what we're doing here. We're creating a play. (laughs) So like, here's a phone number for a therapist, you know, how different could it be for someone who's like in this creative process with you to like also be able to like hold you in that meaning making process. So. Yeah. What you were describing uh, earlier about, you know, the piecing together, a play it reminds me of the exquisite corpse uh the surrealist uh game yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and i mean i really i don't know i (laughs) i see drama therapy and all of the creative arts therapies really as like a paradigm shift 
or, or they have that potential, I think, to really change, like, what do we even think therapy is, or like, what function does it serve? Um, so I don't know, I, I could go all off on a diatribe about capitalism and, and individualization, you know, in American culture, but I think like, what does it mean to build communities and build groups um, and build connections that way? Yeah. Cool. Well, you got anything else for us? Um, I'm very passionate about this. Um, obviously, I wouldn't can tell. <laughs> have done <laughs> everything up to this point. So, you know, I know that, you know, there is a lot of education um, and advocacy that we do as creative arts therapists. And so I would just encourage anyone who wants to know more, please contact me. I'm more than happy um, to talk about any of these things and answer any um, questions that anyone might have. Awesome. Thanks for being on the show, Dana. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Next Quest Podcast. I learned something new today, and I hope you did too. Stay tuned for our episode next week, featuring Kimberly Mead, Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor, on one of her areas of specialty, Trauma and Adults of Adoption. Next Quest Podcast is sponsored by Jan Dimmitt Resources. Save yourself the time and stress of credentialing and let the experts at Jan Dimmitt Resources do what they do best. For over 20 years, Jan Dimmitt Resources has provided administrative support and credentialing services to mental health professionals in Texas and beyond. Visit their website at jandimmitt.com. That is J-A-N-D-I-M-M-I-T-T.com or call 512-731-5725 for more information on all the ways they can make running your practice easier for you. Next Quest Podcasts relies solely on donations to keep this project going. Please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page at www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Podcast, or you can make a one-time donation on my website at www.nextquestcounseling.com slash aboutnextquestpodcast. You can also support the podcast by liking our Facebook page. Until next question, this is Noah Garcia signing off.